Thank you to the to the organizers for the invitation. So I'm very happy to be to be here. So the subject of this talk is not exactly Minfield Games, but there will be some relationships with Minfield Games, and I will try to tell you exactly in which way I have in mind that this could be applied to Minfield Games. Also, I have to say that this is a work in progress. This is not completely achieved, and this is not yet an archive. But as you will see, we have some results. And when I say we, it means that uh, this is a joint work with one postdoc student from University of Nice, so William Hammersley. And so the very basic topic of this talk is to discuss the common noise. So what about choosing a common noise uh, for mainfield games, but possibly for other types of models, and in such a way that we get some nice properties for this common noise. And so this is the, the first slide of my, of my talk. What do we expect or what we would like to have on the, on the noise? Yeah, so the objective is to get some regularization effect by means of the noise. So I'm trying, I would like to use the common noise in such, in such a way that I get some nice modification from in three games. And, and basically, once one modification effect would be to get uniqueness, and for sure, I, I recall you what everybody knows in the room is that uniqueness is a very rare situation in Minfield games. But I would like to restore or to enforce uniqueness by means of uh, a, a specific form of common noise. And somehow this is connected to uh, uh, the discussion that we had yesterday in Pierre Rillion's talk about some possible ways uh, to enforce regularization and uniqueness phenomena for Minfield models with some nonlinear interaction in some way. A short review of, of the literature on this kind of question. There are some known instances where you can indeed enforce uniqueness uh, by means of the common noise. And I guess that one of the first examples in this direction was given in the PhD thesis of Rinal. So Rinal is just uh, in the middle of the audience today. And so what he studied during his PhD thesis is a kind of linear quadratic mainfield games. And basically when the, the cost and the dynamics are linear and quadratic, what happens is that the equilibria are Gaussian. And so this is absolutely trivial somehow to randomize the, the, the equilibria in order to restore uniqueness, because if you use a finite dimensional common noise, which is only additive, what you are going to get in the end is that you randomize the mean of this Gaussian equilibria. And this is sufficient to, um, to enforce uniqueness at the end of the day. Um, to recast what I just said, what happens is that when the equilibria are Gaussian, the master equation is much, much easier. Somehow it becomes a finite dimensional equation. And the usual common noise that you have just um, can be just rephrased in terms of a Laplace, a finite dimensional Laplace in this finite dimensional PDE. And then you can benefit from smoothing effect in finite dimension. There was another example that I studied with. Um, Beraktar, Chekin, and Cohen for finite state space. So now you have minfield games on a finite state space, and you would like to design a shape of common noise for which you can get existence and uniqueness. So I should insist that this should be true, even though you don't have monotonicity for sure. This is absolutely the, or this would be the objective. And so what we did is that we used a type of common noise inspired by the study of population genetics. This is what people call in, in stochastic analysis, right fissure noises. And so in this way, we were able to show that possibly in some manner, uh, this was possible to, to enforce uniqueness. But for sure, the, 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 the very main challenge, at least for me, this is, this is one subject that I like, is to is to have a look at infinite dimensional models. So really, when you have a look at minfield games on a continuous state space. Um, and, and somehow, once again, this is absolutely related to what we had yesterday in, in, uh, in Pierre Rillion's uh, talk. Um, for sure, the very, mass, the very difficult is that since the state space is now infinite dimensional, because this is the state of probability measures, if you just have a common noise as we had yesterday in the talk of Pierre, 
that's not enough to enforce uniqueness and to get some modification phenomena because the common noise that we, we had yesterday in the talk of Pierre, and this was exactly the same type of common noise as the one we had in the, in the book with Pierre, Pierre Green, Jean-Michel, um, this is just finite dimensional. So this is not enough to, to enforce uh, uniqueness. And a, a few years ago, I did one, one paper to say, well, possibly maybe this could be possible to enforce uniqueness by using an infinite dimensional common noise. But the point is that, I did that by lifting the problem in a Hilbert space. And when I said that I was lifting the problem in the Hilbert space, the new problem in the Hilbert space was no longer a main field. I'm, I'm going to explain to you this in the next slide. And this is what I call an extrinsic uh, formulation. So there was no way to come back from the Hilbertian formulation to the main field formulation. And so I was a bit frustrated with this. And this was part of my question that I had in mind to, to guess about a common noise for which the model would be really, really posed on the space of probability measures and not on the Hilbert space of random variables. And basically the talk today is related to this question and there will be some possible answers uh, to, to some questions. I have to say that I'm not the only person wondering about this question and outside mainfield games you have other people wondering about similar questions. In fact, if you, if you Googleize uh, those names, you will find some references on ground emotions on the space of probability measures. So this is what people call Wasserstein diffusion processes. And this is a quite hot topic, but this is a difficult topic. And in fact, there are several attempts towards what could be a ground emotion on the space of probability measures, but people agree to say that there is no canonical definition of what should be a ground emotion. So, you, you will find a list of people here on this slide who, who worked on this, uh, on this subject. You have very, very nice papers by Willem Stanat on the smoothing properties of the fleming view process. Somehow the fleming view process is the infinite dimensional version of the, of the right fissure process that we used uh, with Berakhtar, Chekin and Cohen. And Stanat succeeded to prove some modification properties of the semi-group associated with the fleming view process. But if you have a look at the, the type of smoothing that you get, this is not enough for mainfield games. I'm going to explain to you why next. And then after this, you have other papers. There is one main paper by Sturm and von Renesser really using um, the intrinsic derivative on the space of probability measures, trying to, to, to associate with that the Dirichlet form. Um, and so they, they succeeded to, to define what they called a Wasserstein diffusion. But this is, the construction is very difficult. And this is only achieved under a certain probability measure. There were other attempts, but at the end of the day, you don't have a clear result of modification properties for these noises. I think that people who had a look at this question, maybe they, they really wanted to have something that were really, really canonical. And my prospect today is a bit different. I just want to have a noise for which I have some modification properties. And maybe if this is not exactly what we should call a burn motion, I don't really care at the end of the day. Uh, so this could be the, the difference with these, uh, with these works. To explain to you the connection with Minfield games, because there is a connection, I'm going to give you a, a, a two slides that uh, I used in, in a, a last uh, previous talk in the MFG conference uh, five years ago. This was in, in Italy. And um, I, I started with this very simple Minfield game. So you see that the dynamics are really simple. There is no idiosyncratic noise. I will come back to this question next. And this is very subtle in this problem. So you see that the velocity is the control. And this is the only thing that appears in the, uh, in the dynamics. And if you have a look at the running cost, this is a quite natural running cost. You have uh, um, the cost, you have the running cost, the terminal cost, and the, the kind of kinetic energy. One possible way to study the equilibria is to have a look at, at the Pontryagin system. Um, for sure, you could think of the MFG system by means of the fokker prank equation and the HAB equation. But here, I'm speaking about the Pontryagin system for the simple reason that next, I'm going to work with random variables. So if you think of fokker prank this is really the measure. But I prefer to work with random variables. Uh, so, so somehow, capital X stands for the position of the state of your player at the equilibria. So this is the tag player interpolation. And Y, the Y that you have on the slide, is the optimal control, or minus Y is the optimal control. So this is the, opt the equilibrium velocity. And in the country, again, you directly have 
the dynamics of the velocity. And so you have this equation, so driven by the derivative of the cost and so on. I don't really care. So this system is difficult. This is difficult for two reasons. First, in the space variable, this is degenerate. This is one issue. And second, in the measure variable, you have all the issues that people know here in the audience is that you may get some, uh, some singularities uh, of, the, of the value of the game with respect to the measure parameter. So what I said uh, five years ago is that possibly we could have a look at these equations in the Hilbert space of random variables, and we could put possibly a noise in the dynamics. So to say that, I have to specify what is the probability space on which I have my random variables. And so a possible choice is to say, I'm going to work on the circle. The circle is very convenient because I have the Lebesgue measure on it. I have a Fourier basis. So this is very, very, very easy to do some infinite dimensional analysis on L2 of the circle. This is the reason why I'm working with the circle. So instead of having random variables indexed by little omega, as usually have in probability here now, the random variables are indexed by little x. So little x is an element of the circle. So basically, you have to think of your players as, as being indexed by labels or by angles uh, on the circle. And so now you have your, your system. So you see that these are the three bottom lines on the slides. And once again, X is for the randomness. So you, here now the randomness somehow, this should be the randomness that you have in the initial condition. This is the only randomness that could, you can have in this type of model since there is no idiosyncratic noise. And I would like to randomize this, this equation. I am in a Hilbert space of random variable. And this is exactly what you saw very briefly yesterday in the talk of Pierre Williams. He spoke about this kind of operators. This was in the early slide of, the, uh, of his talk. And so you can try to put, to put an infinite dimensional noise in this. So this is this DW that you have um, in, um, in red on the, on the first equation. So this is what we call an infinite dimensional uh, brown motion or cylindrical brown motion. And if this is not clear, the meaning is not clear for you. This is pretty easy because I'm working on, on the circle. You should have a look at, at the line minus two. So uh, for those of you who are in the audience, this is, uh, this is here. So this is just a sum of independent Brenner motion times the, the Fourier function. So you take the Fourier basis and the coefficient that you put in front of each element of the Fourier basis, this is just a Brenner motion. Usually, this is what people would call or should call the Brenner motion with values in L2. The very drawback of this Brenner motion is that it does not take values in L2. This is the very drawback of it for the simple reason that if you take, if you compute the, the, the sum of the squares of the Fourier modes, these are the sum of the squares of the Brenner motion, you take the expectation of this, well, the expectation is going to diverge. This is absolutely trivial because all the brown emotions, they have the same expectation squared, which is equal to T at time T. And so the, the value of this, or, or this process does not take values in L2. And for sure, this is a drawback because you want to say that you have random variables. And so these are elements of L2. So there is one way, which is to, to, have, to, to, put, to put a penalty. Uh, this is a kind of, of, um, uh, of friction term. Uh, this is a kind of unstand Ullenbeck process in infinite dimensions. So you see that on the top line, on the first equation in red, so you have this, this Laplace term, so here. And the very good point is that under the action of the Laplace, what you, what you do is that in fact, you, you cut uh, somehow the high modes in the expansion of the random variables. And so by composing the action of the noise and the, 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 the heat kernel, you are going to project back somehow the dynamics in L2. And, and now this is fine. Really, the dynamics are, are well posed and they take values in L2. And my talk in, uh, in, in Roma five years ago was exactly about this model. And I said that if you had this model, then in fact, you can have under nice assumption with respect to the X variable for the coefficients F and G because of the fact that there is no idiosyncratic noise in the dynamics. I said that in fact, you have existence and uniqueness, even though this is not uh, monotone with respect to the direction of the, of the measure. But this is disappointing in terms of, of, of mean field models, because now the model is no longer intrinsic. When I say that this is not intrinsic, it means that if you take two random variables, two random variables with the same distribution, the solution might not be the same, just because 
the Laplace is completely local. This is a local operator. And so you may destroy the, 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 the invariance property of the model with respect to a rearrangement. And so once again, I was a bit frustrated with this. And what I would like to explain to do today is one possible way to, to, to go beyond this problem and to, to get something that is, uh, that is really main field. Uh, so, so once again, the reason why I want to have something that is really main field is that this is not satisfactory to have something that is in extrinsic in the sense that you take two random variables with the same low and they don't produce the same, the same description of the population at the end of the day. It, it does not fit our model. Also, certainly for these types of model, you would like to lose the symmetry of the model, which is exactly what you are given by the mean field structure. And when you use the symmetry, this is a way also to reduce the size of the problem of the, the, the state space. So this is what I'm going to call rearranged noise. So the, the, the idea is very simple and, and then you have to play with, with math. Very first thing is that all the talk is in dimension one. This is one drawback of what I'm going to say. This is one step into the analysis and you cannot solve all the questions at a single time. So everything is in dimension one. So my random variables themselves are in dimension one. This is a limitation, but if you have a look at the literature on brown emotions on the space of probability measures, almost all the papers are also in dimension one. This is very difficult, even in dimension one, to say exactly what you should have as a brown emotion on the space of probability measures. So what I'm going to say is that I take the same equation as before. So this is uh, the first equation. Now you see that I'm going to forget for a while the, the, the mean field game itself. The only thing that matters is the type of the noise. So this was the, this uh, delta xt plus dwt that you had in the, previous, uh, in the previous lines. And the intuitively the expansion of W in, in Fourier modes is exactly the same as before. Just for those of you who are not really aware of, of this kind of, of equations, the solution is, is very simple. So this is the bottom line of this slide. You just make a kind of duML formula and you say that to get the solution, you take the initial condition you apply the Hick kernel, which is what I'm going to denote by exponential t delta. So exponential t delta, this is nothing but the, the convolution by the Hick kernel. And you do the same for the noise. And so for the noise, you have a stochastic integral. And when you compute the L2 norm of this stochastic integral, you have Ito isometry. And if you compute the expansion in Fourier modes, well, this is well-defined. This is an element of L2. And so this xt has a meaning. Once again, this model is in the Hilbert space. Curious, is the, the restriction to dimension one is, if I remember correctly, the heat equation does not have a function valued solution in higher dimension. Is that the purpose of this? Restriction? No, 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 it's going to be next. Exactly at the, this is the next operation that I'm going okay, to do. Okay. In fact, in the results that I presented in, in Italy, I explained that certainly we could do also things in higher dimension. This was possible, we still have, Thank you for this question. X can be in dimension one, so little x, the probability space. But what matters is, is the, um, the dimension of the random variable. So you have this capital X in this equation. And when I say that D is equal to one, it means that this random variable takes values in dimension one. So you could have a system of, of these equations. Uh, uh, all of them would be on the circle and they would make sense. So, so what you are speaking about, this would not be a problem. But for what I'm going to do, I would not be able to do exactly what I'm going to do if capital X were valued in a higher dimensional space. I think that this is clear now. Okay. So thank you for this, for this question. So what I'm going to do is to use the fact that in, in dimension one, there is a simple way to identify a random variable and a measure. This is what people call rearrangement. So when you have a random variable, you can rearrange this random variable in a non-decreasing manner. I'm going to explain to you this next for those of you who are not exactly aware of this notion, but this is simply that when you have the distribution of a random variable, you can have a look at the quantile function. And so the quantile function is non-decreasing and this is a canonical choice for representing the probability measure. And so what I say is that here you can do the same. And so you can have a kind of splitting scheme on a very, very small piece of time, you apply the dynamics of the heat equation and then you rearrange and you restart and you rearrange and you restart and you rearrange and so on. 
So this is the bottom line that you have on this slide. You see that you start from a random variable, xt. And once again, you have to think of this random variable as being non-decreasing, so canonically associated with a probability measure. You apply the, 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 the dynamics of the, uh, of the standard and back process. This is a random variable. Maybe this is no longer non-decreasing, but then you rearrange. And somehow when you rearrange, you project back in some way onto the space of probability measure. And you wonder about the behavior of this kid. So just to, to, to be sure that this is clear for all of you, what I'm going to call rearrangement is exactly the same as quantile function in probability theory. So if you take a probability measure on R, you can have a look at the um, uh, cumulative distribution function. And if you take the inverse uh, of this uh, cumulative distribution function, so this is the quantile function. And you know that if you have a look at the law of the quantile function on zero one or on the circle equipped with the, uh, with the Lebesgue measure, then this is exactly the law of, the, of your random variable. So this is a canonical way uh, to, to represent uh, a probability measure in terms of a non uh, in terms of a random variable. So, so the bottom line here is exactly what I'm going to, I just said. If you take a probability measure mu, you choose a random variable that is exactly the quantile function, and the law of this random variable is exactly uh, the law you started from. And so here, I would like to do the same, except that I'm going to, to work on the circle. So if I were on zero one, I would do exactly this. I would work with non-decreasing quantile function. And since I'm working now with the, with, on the circle, I'm just going to symmetrize. I'm going to show you a plot. This is a way to preserve periodicity. Um, so you work on zero one half. This is non-decreasing, and then you reflect and this is decreasing. I'm going to show you a plot. This will be, uh, this will be easier. So just a, 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 small, uh, a small example so that this is clear for all of you. If this is not clear, certainly the rest of the talk will be uh, too complicated. The, the very simple example, if you take a, a uniform uh, a probability measure on a, on a finite set, so here the, the number of outcomes is capital M, and so you say that uh, between i over n and i plus one over n, the value of your random variable is ai. So you think of a histogram, for instance. So this is this ai in blue on the top line. And then what you do when you rearrange is, that, is just that you reorder the values ai. So in, in probability, this would be uh, somehow uh, taking the order statistics. So you just reorder the values of the ai. This is what you are doing. And so you shift or you, you rearrange the values in such a way that you do not change the, 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 the law of the random variable. Just a picture. Uh, this is an exercise that I did uh, uh, in my room yesterday. So you start with this um, an example of this uh, random variable, which is uh, stepwise. So you see that you have, so this is the, the, the left pane, bottom left pane on, on the slide. So you have uh, different steps. So you have your different values. And then you, you reorder those values. So here, just to, 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 to exemplify, you have uh, on three intervals, you have the lowest value. So you put all these three lowest value uh, at the first, on the first uh, um, part of the, of the interval zero one. And next you have these two ones here. I'm sorry for those of you who are online. You, you, you gather these two ones, this is this step. This one is going to be here, it doesn't move. And the top one, the top one here is going to be the last one. So this is your rearrangement. Now, if you want to symmetrize, uh, you just make a dilation. And, and so you say, uh, you, you, you just multiply by one half the previous, uh, the previous picture and you reflect by symmetry. So this is something that is better in the sense that this is symmetric and it looks like more something that is periodic. So this is the way you can, uh, you can rearrange your, your random variable. Back to my problem, I can define an Euler scheme and wonder about the limiting behavior of this Euler scheme according to this idea. So I say, I tack, so you see that there are two, param two parameters in this Euler scheme. There is little Hertz, which is the, the step size of the scheme and little m, which is the, the time in the Euler scheme. And so what I do is that you have this x and hertz random variable inside the, 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 the right hand side. And so you have the 
the, the dynamics of the of the heat equation of the stochastic heat equation. So you have a little piece of Gaussian convolution here, and you have the noise, and then you have the star operation in red. So on the on the top line on the top formula in red, you have the star operation, which is to say that you rearrange the value, and you wonder about the limiting behavior of this scheme when little h is going to tend to zero. So do you have a nice equation in the limit? Uh, some, do you have some equation and what are the properties of this equation? Fortunately, I'm not able to prove that. Maybe this is because I, I, I don't know, or we, because uh, there is also William Hammersley involved in the story. We are not able to do the computations, but I can explain to you why we are not able to do this computation. It looks very strange that we are not able to do that. In fact, it comes from the, 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 the bad property that it's very difficult to combine the heat kernel and the star operation. At some point, this is exactly the, the difficulty that you face. So I'm going to tell you the, the very principle of the analysis. So don't worry that there won't be too, too technical computation, but this one is absolutely fundamental. And this, this is not our idea. It comes back from a paper from Brunier Brunier did many, many, many things around this type of uh, rearrangement properties in fluid mechanics. So there was basically no noise in his, uh, in his papers, but he, he was willing to have some numerical schemes in fluid mechanics, and he was explaining the, 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 the interest to have rearrangement. I'm, I'm not able to explain all, all his works, but we took part of, his, uh, of, uh, of his ideas in this, uh, in this paper. So there is one, one property that is crucial with uh, rearrangement is that this is non-expensive. So this is what you see on the, um, on the line in the middle. So if you take U star minus V star, you have a look at the L2 norm. So you cannot increase, uh, you cannot increase the L2 norm of the difference uh, when you take the rearrangement. So you see that this is less than U minus V L2. So this is really the L2 norm of the, uh, on, the, um, on the torus. And so what you have to do in the analysis of the other scheme is to apply this non-expansion property with U star being the position of the other scheme at time M plus one and V star that is exactly this, uh, this function or no, not exactly this function, the, 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 the location of the scheme at time capital N for another time, a long time before a, a little M. And you just propagate, um, you are going to see why, but you can forget about this one for the moment. You propagate by the heat kernel um, along the right uh, amount of time. And so you, you apply the non-expansion property with exactly, I'm sorry, here, this is a mistake. There is no star on the bottom line. There is no star in you. I'm sorry, U is without the star. So this is what you have inside this formula without the star and V is equal to V star. And so you see what you have. You do the computation, don't worry, I don't want to be too, too technical. So if you compare the, the, the distance, or if you have a look at the distance between the, the, the location of the scheme at time M plus one and the position of the scheme at time capital N transported by the heat equation, then you have two terms that appears. There is one term at time M. This is exactly the same, the same term at, at the time before, but you have a one step of heat kernel inside. And plus, you have the impact of the noise. The impact of the noise in the paper of Brunig, you don't have this because basically the models are completely deterministic. But now in our model, we have the noise. And what you want to do is that you want to compute the size of this, which is exactly the, mic the microscopic air impact of the noise. And if you do the computation, you realize that when the noise is a white noise, this is something that is h to the power one minus something. I don't care about the exact exponent. This is strictly less than one. And now if, if you come back to the first term, you realize that there is a difficulty because you would like to iterate this computation. The very bad way would be to say, I'm going to use the fact that the, the heat kernel is a contraction and then I can remove the heat kernel here. If I do that, I'm dead. There is no way to, to, to go further because I will make the sum of things of size h to the minus one minus something. So at the end of the day, I will have h to the minus one for the number of terms I have on a macroscopic time, times this term, and this is over. So the only possible way is to be really, really uh, accurate and to see how there is a combination between the, uh, the heat kernel and the operation star that I have when I repeat this argument. And this looks very complicated. 
So we don't know how to, de to do this computation. So at first time we were a bit, uh, a, a bit disappointed, but we cheated as usual. When you don't know how to do things, uh, several people explained this before me in this conference, you cheat. And the way you cheat is that instead of using a white noise, we are going to use a colored noise, which means that in the Fourier expansion, you kill the high modes with at some given rate. So this is the term that you have in red here. So you put this uh, uh, n minus lambda and lambda is, uh, maybe there is an absolute value. I'm sorry, I forgot the absolute value uh, around m. Um, so lambda is a, is a rate between one half strict and one. And this range is, is absolutely crucial for the rest of the talk. Now, if you do the same computation as before, you realize that the noise now takes values in L2 it takes values in L2. You just, you just make the, you compute the, the expectation of the square of this, and you realize that this is in L2. So you could say, well, that's fine. If the noise is in L2, there is no longer need of the Laplace in the dynamics. Because I explained to you that the Laplace in the dynamics were really useful to get a friction. And because of this friction, I was able, I was able to, to transfer the white noise somehow into the, the space of random variables. But the answer is that, no, no, you have to keep the Laplace. And this is something that is very well known in SPD theory. When you restore the Laplace in a, in a stochastic heat equation with a color noise, you still preserve the smoothing effect. You can find this in the book by Daprato, for instance. But if you remove the Laplace and you just have the color noise, then you no longer have the, 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 the smoothing effect. You just have a smoothing effect in some direction only and not in any direction. So this is absolutely crucial to preserve uh, the Laplace. Uh, to, to define, uh, to define the, the scheme. So you come back to the model and now you replace my W, the, the, the noise that I had before by W tilde, which is exactly the same noise, except that you, you have put a, a rate of decay uh, in, the, in the higher Fourier modes, which is a way to enforce the noise to be, uh, to be more regular and maybe uh, you expect to, to, get it, uh, to get it better. And so you, you come back to the, uh, to the same question as before and you do exactly the same analysis. So you have a look at some increments between the, 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 the position of the scheme at time m plus one at, and at time m. Forget for this exponential for the moment, I'm going to explain you next, what is the impact of this uh, uh, convolution by the heat kernel in X capital M. And you apply exactly the same arguments, non-expansion property as in the, in the papers of by Brodier. And now the very good point is that the size of the, uh, of the noise is fine. This is a capital O of H, just because you, you, you chose sufficiently, uh, um, sufficiently fast uh, decaying uh, Fourier coefficients. And then once you have this, the remainder is of size O of, cap, uh, o of H. And now to pass from this, from this line to this line, you can just use the fact that the heat kernel is a contraction in L2 and you can iterate. It looks pretty simple. And so what you have at the end of the day is that the magnitude or the size of the increments. So this is a kind, the kind of time regularity of the Euler scheme is controlled by the length, the time length that you have behind. So, what you wonder at the end of the day, or what you say is that certainly there is, uh, I did a typo here. I'm sorry, there is a typo in my last formula. There is no exponential here on the, uh, let me put this with the, uh, with the pointer so that everybody has this. So, so this term, this term you, you have to remove this exponential where you have the pointer on the slide. So you have two terms. We have exactly the, the time length, which is exactly, uh, the blue and red part, and you have the distance between the random variable xm and uh, the convolution of the same random variable. And to address the last term, this is something that, uh, that is well known in, uh, in Fourier analysis or in, in the analysis of the, uh, of the semi-group of the, of, the, of, the, of the heat kernel. To, to compute the distance between a function and the convolution of this function, uh, certainly this is better if you have a bit of regularity on the function. So it means that here, certainly you, you would like to have some a priori estimates on X capital N. So this is something that we did. And once again, uh, um, this is something that you can do. I don't want to be too technical, but in fact, you can compute the derivative in space of your random variable. What you have is that 
you control the derivative in space of the random variable in terms of what you had uh, at the previous time and the derivative of the noise, which is also in H one minus something. And here, this is exactly the same problem as before. If, if you, you can exchange the derivative in X and the heat kernel, so you get the term in blue on the slide. So you have the heat kernel applying to the derivative at the previous step. But if you, if you use the fact that the heat kernel is contractive, once again, you're dead. So there is one thing that you need, and we just proved a very simple inequality by means of many things that are known on the rearrangement of, uh, of functions in dimension one, is that if you have a look at, so this is the bottom line on the slide, if you have a look at the derivative of the heat kernel of the rearrangement, you can control this by the derivative of the heat kernel of the previous function that you started from, but the, 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 um, the variance in the kernel of the heat kernel, you have to decay it a little bit. So you see that this is not here, the, the variance is exactly H. Here you have to say that the variance is H times rho, and you make the integral with respect to rho. So this is one result that we, we got uh, in, our, in our analysis. And if you do that, somehow, this is a way to exchange the derivative the heat kernel and the rearrangement and to propagate the modification, the modification effect or the smoothing effect of the heat kernel in the, in the analysis. So at the end of the, of the day, this is the end of the computation. What you have is that the distance between the, the position of the heat of the Euler's at time N and the same, but at time capital N is more or less, so in L2 norm, in square L2 norm, this is more or less the, the time length uh, that, that you spend between capital M and little m. In probability theory, once you have this, this is almost what you call tightness. This is not exactly tightness because tightness, which is a kind of compactness, in fact, I'm going to explain this very quickly. For having tightness by means of Kolmogorov uh, arguments, you would need to replace the, the, the power two that you have in blue by a larger power p, but I'm not going to explain this. These are tedious computations that you can do. But basically, the, the idea is exactly this one. And so the final result for this section is that the, your scheme converges to a limiting process. So the convergence, this is what we call a weak convergence. If you don't know exactly what it means, you just take for granted the, the last two lines. It means that this is a kind of almost sure convergence for a tilde process, and the tilde process has the same low as the process that you started from. So you, you can just regard this as a kind of almost sure convergence for a new process, which has the same distribution. So you have a limiting object. And now the question is, what about this limiting object? What can we say about it? And do we have some nice properties on this object? So this is what I called uh, the rearrangement of the stochastic heat equation. So I postulate or I claim that at the end of the day, you get a stochastic equation that is reflected. The fact that you have a reflection, this is not exactly a surprise because for those of you who know reflected equation, this is exactly what I'm doing now. On each small step, I get the rearrangement and this is a way to project on the space of non-decreasing functions. So this is a way to enforce the solution to be a quantile function and so to be canonically identified with a probability measure. And so this is, once again, this is the, when you pass to the limit and you make all the computations, you get exactly a stochastic heat equation with a reflection. And now you, I just have to say that we are not the first one to study the stochastic PDEs with a reflection. And I have to say that other people did that. Uh, so Donati and Pardou, Noir and Pardou, uh, Zamboti as well. So they did exactly reflected SPDs, um, but the reflection is to preserve the positivity of the solution. Uh, there are some connections, in fact, because here what I want to preserve is the, the fact that this is non-decreasing. And when you think about the positivity, somehow this is preserving the, the sign of the derivative. So um, there are some connections, but the two equations are not the same. If you really compare, they are not the same, but in spirit, there, there are some connections. And also you have, after this, other works by Barbou, Daprato, Tubaro, Rockner. Um, so uh, people uh, really aware of, uh, of SPDs who try to get some very general result about uh, reflected SPDs. But as far as we saw, 
none of those results directly covers the equation that we have now. And so we have to more or less to deal uh, by hand this equation and to, to explain what are the properties of this, uh, of this equation. So the, the very first thing is what is eta? So eta, this is a reflection. This is a kind of pushing force uh, that is uh, acting infinitesimally and that forces the solution to, to be really non-decreasing. So when you, you are, when you are at time t, you have a small kick because of the noise and because of the Laplace, you lose, you lose the, uh, the, 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 the non-decreasing property. And then by means of this projection or by means of this reflection, you are pushed back onto the, the cone of, uh, of uh, non-decreasing random variables. And so the properties that you have at the end of the day is that if you, if you take a test function u that is non-decreasing in the symmetric sense, because I explained to you that I had to symmetrize on the, on the torus, you acting on d eta, this is non-negative. It comes back, uh, or it comes from the results that you have on the rearrangement itself. This is what you, you have at the end of the day. And, and these kind of things, maybe this, this was not written in this way in the, in the paper by Brunier, but certainly you can, you can see this, uh, this kind of thing. So this is for a test function acting on d eta. This is non-negative. Now the question to give really a sense to d eta is to say, if I take a process z with values in, um, in a suitable space, is it possible to give a meaning uh, to, uh, to d eta or, or to the integral of z with respect to d eta? And the answer is yes, provided that z is smooth enough. I'm going to explain to you why. And so if z is acting on d eta and z is non-decreasing symmetric, this is positive. And so this process is non-decreasing. And so the way we constructed this process is to say that you can expand formally in terms of Fourier coefficients. And if you expand in terms of Fourier coefficients, somehow since this term, you can expand this term into decreasing and non-decreasing parts. And so this is more or less of bounded variation. So this is a kind of a, a stitch or a bounded variation integral. And you can give a meaning to any of these integrals for any Fourier coefficients. And then at the end of the day, you just uh, prove that Z is smooth enough, uh, uh, this decay is fast enough. And so you can give a meaning to this. So I'm a bit, uh, a bit, a bit vague in my explanation, but you, get, you can give a meaning to this, uh, to this integral. So based on this, you have a definition of solution to this uh, reflected uh, S, uh, SPD. So you require the SPD to be satisfied in a weak sense for any test function U that is uh, smooth enough. And you require that eta has to be positive or non-decreasing when acting on processes Z with values in L2, which are continuous. And you see that I put a little bit of modification because when I have the action of D eta onto random variable, I need this random variable to be smooth enough. So I have a little bit of convolution. And then I require that the sign of this is positive. So this is for any Z that takes values in the, in the space of, or in the cone of non-decreasing random variables. And I have a kind of least action principle that says that when I have, I replace Z by the solution itself, then I have exactly, in fact, minimality in this condition, which is exactly to say that X must be somehow orthogonal to D eta. This is a computation that you can, you can do uh, uh, based on the rearrangement property. So these are the three computations that you have or the three properties that you have to get a notion of solution. And so the next result, um, I have to, to move forward, um, is that we have, so we get a solution by, by compactness arguments started from the earlier scheme and we have uniqueness. So the, the arguments of uniqueness is a bit, uh, is not that difficult. Uh, this is the usual argument for reflected equation for those of you, and I know that some of you know very well uh, reflected uh, SDEs. Uh, you just expand two solutions uh, of the L2 difference between two solutions. The only subtlety is that since you, you need modified random variable, there is a small modification by the heat kernel in the computation, but morally it does not change anything. So when you do the computation, you have that the L2 norm of the difference between two solutions is exactly uh, uh, bounded by the difference between two solutions acting on d eta minus d eta prime. And you use the fact that x d eta is equal to zero, x prime d eta prime is equal to zero. And at the end of the day, you have x prime d eta, x d eta prime, and 
this is non negative, non decreasing, this is non decreasing. And so the sign of this must be positive. And so the sign is negative, and then you get equality. And in fact, you have a little bit more than this. You see that you have some properties in a, in a H1, which is very useful for the rest of the talk. Um, and so, in fact, you can transfer this uh, uniqueness argument into a, a stability property on, uh, on the flow. So you take two random variables. And in fact, this is, uh, this is Lipschitz. And the Lipschitz property uh, is also for the derivative. Uh, so in some uh, H1 norm uh, for, the, uh, for the flow. So this is where you are. So you get an equation. And now you want to come back to the original program. What about the, uh, the smoothing properties of this equation? So I have a, a 10 minutes around um, to explain to you the smoothing effect, which is exactly my original purpose. Uh, this is what I wanted to have. So let me just make a, a, a short recap of what we know about reflection of uh, sorry, smoothing uh, for SPDs so without reflection. So when I speak about smoothing, it means that you have a look at the semi-group that is induced by the, by the process. So here, if you don't have reflection, so you take a function phi that is a function on the space of random variables. At the end of the day, this will be a function on the space of probability measures. And then this is lifted by means of Lyons lift. You take a random variable. And so you map this onto the expectation of phi xt. So this is the, the location of your process at time t when you start it from x naught. And so we have plenty of results about this when there is no reflection. So th these are the results by the Italian school, uh, Da Prato uh, um, and, uh, and, um, and uh, his, uh, his collaborators, uh, Zapchik, uh, Debuch uh, also as well. Um, so if, there is a very nice book on uh, SPDs by Da Prato. This was a textbook in, uh, by Springer, very, very nice. And if you have a look at uh, in this book, uh, this is very well explained that once again, this is what I tell you. If you remove the Laplace, you just keep the noise. There is no way to get a very nice smoothing effect. In fact, you, get, you just get smoothing in some direction. And if I'm correct uh, here for the same lambda as before, this would be a, a direction in a, in a sub OLF space. Yeah, anyway. Right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. This is with lambda, absolutely. Uh, and if you put the Laplace, once again, no, no reflection. Uh, same book by Da Prato. He explains to you what happens. The fact is that the, the, the heat kernel maps L2 in the, in the sobol of space. And so uh, you can close the loop. And so there is modification in any direction because once again, by the heat kernel, you will be mapped uh, into the right space for which you have the smoothing without, without the Laplace. So this is without reflection. Now with reflection, uh, so... Uh, this is a difficult question uh, when you have reflection. Uh, very first thing I should say that in probability, when you study uh, smoothing properties of a, of a, of a process, the, the, the very systematic tool is Gersanoff theorem. You can elaborate by using many event calculus and so on, but one very basic strategy, very robust, is Gersanoff, so change of probability measure. Usually, this is the way it works. And you, we, you get in this way what we call integration by parts. And Maliavan calculus is an elaborated version of this integration by parts. But when you have some reflection, this is, uh, this is more difficult to get reflection uh, uh, integration by parts. And, and there was a nice paper by Doshel and Zambotti uh, uh, 15 years ago about, about this question. So basically, what I'm going to say here is it works if you want to have the Lipschitz property of the semi group. So you, you, you are going to map a bounded function into a Lipschitz function. And morally, for minfield games, this is, uh, this is enough. The, the strategy is that usually in, uh, in, uh, in stochastic analysis, to prove uh, smoothing properties, this is not the only way, but this is one general way. You take the flow of your equation, you take the derivative of the flow, and then you make a Gersanoff transform, and it works. So the difficulty here is that because of the reflection, you cannot take derivative uh, with respect to the flow. There is no nice derivative because of the reflection. And this is the difficulty that was pointed in the, in the paper of Deutsch. Anyway, we can cheat. I'm not going to explain this. And I'm going to do as if uh, we, could, uh, we, took, we could take derivatives in the flow. So this is the last complicated computation in my talk. The way it works is that, so this is something that is absolutely well known in, uh, in stochastic analysis. Uh, here, we just have to to explain that this works in the reflective setting. 
you take the same uh, the same flow as the same process as before xt, but you see on the top line that you you have a perturbation of the of the initial position, and this perturbation is dynamic, meaning that you see that when little t is equal to zero, when little t is equal to zero, you start from x zero plus z. Z is the direction, and when t is equal to capital T for some capital T. X capital T is just computed at X zero. So this is a way to start away from your point X zero in some X zero plus a perturbation and to end up exactly where you want to end up. So what you do is that you expand. And when you expand, in fact, here, so these are part of the computations. And uh, by the way, I did a mistake. This is a plus here anyway. Um, so you have exactly the same dynamics as before, so with a plus in the last term, and you have the derivative of the, of the flow that appears. So this is the derivative of X with respect to the direction of perturbation. And so it at tilde in this equation, and this is part of the difficulty, you have to prove that this is a new nice reflective process. When you, you make this, uh, this perturbation of the flow, somehow you don't change too much the, the reflective structure. Anyway, what you say is that you regard the derivative of the flow plus the noise as a new noise. And you want to say under a new probability measure, this is exactly the same equation as before. And I can use Gersanov to identify the semi-group. The difficulty is that when you do that, you have to remember that the Fourier coefficients of the, the higher Fourier modes here, they decay pretty fast. So this is a W, not a B, sorry about this. So you have M minus lambda in the Fourier modes uh, number M. And so it means that when you have a look at the Fourier uh, expansion of DL2, uh, morally, you have to multiply by M lambda. But you remember the previous slide I told you about, when you have a look at stability properties, able to get uh, some, uh, some properties uh, for the derivative themselves. So you, you're able to multiply a little bit uh, your Fourier coefficients by something that, that increases a, a little bit, that is a little bit uh, uh, grower, uh, faster than, uh, than one. So you can make a Gersanov change of variable. And so this is my, the conclusion of this computation. So you can make a Gersanov. This is, this is just what I'm saying. And so in the end, if you compute PT5 or PT5 of X0 plus Z, so which is exactly what you want to, to compute here, what you realize is that this is the expectation of phi of XT under a new probability measure Q. And so when you take the derivative with respect to Z, in fact, in the right-hand side, the only thing that you have to do is to take the derivative inside the probability measure. And you have the explicit shape for this probability measure, which is given by Gersanov. And this is the way you get, uh, you get the integration by parts formula. So it seems to be fine here. So this is the, the, final, uh, the final result that I want to stress. So this is the estimate that we have for the semi-group. And we have uh, the, the key point is that the for sure, the, the, the Lipschitz estimate is bad if phi is just bounded. And what matters for application is the, the rate at which it blows up in small time. This is the only thing that matters in the analysis of nonlinear equations. And the very good point is that we are able to get an, an exponent here, one plus lambda divided by two, that is strictly less than one, which means that this is integrable. And if you know a bit of nonlinear equation, when you have an integrable, uh, singularity, uh, certainly you are able to reproduce the analysis uh, uh, coming from uh, finite dimension. Uh, I can explain to you this next if you, if you have a question. Um, anyway, so at the end of the day, th this is our last result. So this is not as good as in the finite dimension with a, a real ground motion for which you have T minus one half. So this is a, a little bit uh, worse. So if you think of the critical the boundary case, lambda is equal to one half, which is the best we can choose. Uh, it means that you have a three over four, but anyway, this is integrable. And the fact that this is integrable, certainly this is enough to apply to, to mean three days. So I'm done with this, uh, with this uh, presentation. The only thing I want to say is that I have some further prospect. If you have uh, questions, I, I can answer. But for mean field games, so you can write the master equation for the same problem as the one I told you before without idiosyncratic noise. And this is something we have not done for the moment. You put in addition the generator of this uh, process uh, that I described to you. And since the, the, the smoothing effect is integrable, maybe you can get, uh, you can get uh, 
the Lipschitz estimate that you need to iterate the small time results into a longer time result. So this is one first remark. Second remark is that for sure, what I would like to do for minfield games is to put an idiosyncratic noise. This is not so trivial uh, because you have to combine uh, the impact of the, of the common noise and the impact of the idiosyncratic noise. It means that uh, philosophically what you do is that you have your random variable that is, uh, that is uh, rearranged. And what does the, the idiosyncratic noise is that it makes a convolution of the law of this random variable. So you, you have your, your rearranged random variable, you have a look at this in terms of a probability measure, you make a convolution by a very small, uh, uh, with a heat kernel with a very small variance, and then you iterate. And so you have a new, a new splitting scheme between uh, uh, idiosyncratic noise and, um, and, uh, and common noise, but this, uh, I, I don't know exactly. And the next question uh, is a higher dimension. Uh, you saw here that we, we, we just use the uh, rearrangement and, and for sure it works only in dimension one. So here, uh, my, 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 my feeling is not completely uh, clear, I have to say. One possible way, but I don't know, it might be to use optimal transportation, which is a kind of a generalization of rearrangement in a, in a higher dimension, but, but I don't know. I have not studied this uh, in detail. This is just one possible question that you can wonder. So I think that I have on time, thank you. Are there any questions? Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I have a naive question. At some part in the beginning, you have this symmetry that you draft at the rearrangement, re symmetration. Where does it serve in the computation? I probably missed that. No, in fact, it, 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 this is very useful in, um, in some of the properties of the rearrangement. There, there are, in the analysis, you use some properties of the rearrangement. And there are some inequalities that we use for symmetrized rearrangement, and this is useful. Another reason to have this um, is to say that certainly if you think of a continuous function on the torus, if you, if you just rearrange in, in, a, in a naive manner, this would be just uh, non-decreasing, and so you would lose continuity. And so the, the regularity of, B, of it would be bad. And so this is certainly better to say that you start from zero to one half, and then you decrease back to preserve continuity. Rearrangement cannot increase uh, the modulus of continuity, preserve the modulus of continuity. But if you want to get something that is periodic, uh, if, this is, uh, if the boundary conditions are not the same, it means that somehow you will get something that is non-periodic. So this is another way to explain that this is better to symmetrize. Maybe another question. In the noise form, the Ws, the Brian motions that are in, they are on the same space. On this, they are also defined on the circle. No, 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 they are completely, no, no, they, they, are, they are defined. Oh, no, thank you for this question. Certainly I should have said that. No, no, they are defined on another probability space. The, 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 the point is that in mean field games, so the thing that you want to have is, is the law of the population. And under the action of the common noise, randomize the law of the population. So you say, when you compute the law, you compute the law with respect to small x. And now on the top of this, you have another noise, which randomizes your random variable and so your, your probability measures. So, so they are constructed on another space. Uh, sorry, I should have specified this. You think about mean field games precisely where you have a finite number of players, large, uh, and uh, when the number of players goes to infinity, you find your, your process. What should be the, what should happen to this player to, if you try to discretize the, the stuff, a uh, finite so, number of players? But, yes, that, that, that's a really good question. So certainly this is something that you can write down. So. For the Laplace, these are local interaction. So, it, so the very first thing is that, I forgot to say, you put your players at the, uh, at the roots of, uh, of one. So, so you see uh, exponential i to pi over n. So, so you, you, they, are, they have some sides on the circle and they, they sit down on those sides and, and, and these are exactly the roots of, uh, of one. Um, okay, so these are their location. And so very first thing is that you have the Laplace which means that if you are on a given site, you are going to see your, your two neighbors. This is the non-local interaction, which is the, the drawback of the model. So for a small piece of time in the earlier scheme, you, you run these, uh, these dynamics for your particle system in which you, you see your neighbors. Then you have a new, um, a new cloud of, uh, of, of states. And so what I claim is that you should rearrange these, uh, these values. And, and th this is, this is exactly what, what should happen. So you should reorder the values and then you should restart from this new, uh, this new initial condition. We have not checked this, but in fact, this was our intuition that uh, certainly th this would be the analog of the, uh, 
of the model. So you, you, would, you should reorder the values. May I uh, ask a question here? Yes, yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you for the very interesting presentation. So I'm curious about the space noise. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm curious about the space noise where you um, we uh, use the Fourier base, um, which is compatible with the heat kernel. So I was wondering if um, there would be any difficulties if we just use uh, any um, um, any base for the uh, like any other base for the white noise. Okay, the, the very good point is that here the Fourier base is is very well fitted to the to the Laplace. Uh, the, the point is that the fact that the, the Fourier basis are or the Fourier functions are the eigenfunctions of the of the Laplace, yeah. well, this is very helpful in the analysis because you know exactly uh, what are the uh, what are the decays, uh, the Fourier decays in the uh, in, in the solution. So, I would suspect that if you change the basis, then you have to change accordingly the the Laplace into a new operator such that. Mm -hmm. the, the eigenvalues uh, along this new basis uh, behave more or less in the same way. Mm -hmm. Now, so your next question could be, uh, what happens if I replace the Laplace? I think that this is very useful to keep the Laplace precisely for the, the, the question of Pierre, which is that if you want to discretize, you have a very, very simple interpretation of the Laplace in terms of the discrete model. You know what it means. You, you just take, you are sitting on the side, you have a look at the two, the two neighbors around you and you, you, you make a kind of a finite difference and then you have an approximation of your Laplace. Uh, and this is the reason why I, I want to keep the Laplace is that if you think of a discretization, certainly we know what it means. And so if you choose the Laplace, I would say that this is much, much uh, reasonable to have the Fourier, uh, the Fourier basis. This is my answer. So, um, of course, a very nice, in just let's say that going to higher dimensions, you were saying two dimensions, you could say, okay, naively, should you just do a coordinate wise rearrangement, which will not work probably, probably but if, not, if so, why not? And so, uh, I, I think that the drawback of this is that you lose, uh, so some, somehow if you do this, you, you lose the joint distribution. So, because you rearrange the, the first coordinate, you rearrange the second coordinate, but you want to keep track of the, of the law of the, exactly. the joint law. So that's the difficulty. So, so yes, so you should keep indeed, you should work on the circle. You could work on the circle, rearrange coordinate wise, but once again, you, 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 would, you, would, lose the, you would lose the joint law of, uh, of your random variable. So you would just keep the marginal lows of your random variable. And, and this is the drawback. But if they're independent, I mean, if you're, if you're driving by independent coordinate wise, independent brownian motions, then does it matter in that case? Uh, maybe, but, but if you think of mean field games, this is clear that there will be correlations at the end of the day. I mean, you, of the X's, yes, but of the noise as well? No, for uh, the noise, because, this is okay. fine, but, but, but at the end of the day, right. yeah, uh, what yeah, you yeah. really want is, is, is that- Yeah, the X's are X, getting intertwined. Yeah, yeah, yeah they yeah. will be interconnected and coordinate one is going to see coordinate two. And no, this is really the difficulty that we have. Okay, that's, um, that's... And this is another difference with respect to the Hilbert model. In, in the Hilbertian model, you don't have this problem. You directly lift everything in, in, in the space of random variables and you don't care about this question. Mm -hmm. When you want to project back, this is a difficulty. Maybe this is a serious drawback. I, I, I don't know about this. That's very interesting. Thank you so much. There is a question by Alpar. Hello. Uh, I, I was just wondering whether, uh, do you have an associated Dirichlet form and an invariant measure as in the work of uh, Sturm and von Renese? Well, at, at this stage, we have not studied yet the invariant measure. This is something that we are, we are now studying. This is a very good question. But no, at this stage, we have not studied the long-term behavior. So thank you for this question so once again we started from another uh, another uh, point of view so what we want wanted to have is some smoothing effect and so we started with the local time or finite time properties and now indeed one question is about the long term behavior for the long term behavior i have to say that since you are working on the on the on the space of probability measures maybe you have some nice compactness properties and, and so what you have to prove now is uh, somehow is some time of irreducibility or th these are the things that we are trying to do trying to do now thank you for this question thank you other questions yeah just a uh, lay my question uh for this theory, when you use uh, regularization, uh, say you get a uniqueness, is it because uh, after this modification, uh, this solution must stay, say, in a, a good region of the solution space? Uh, in other words, when you have non uniqueness, the solution uh, uh, is somehow in a bad region. So if you avoid that bad region, then you get uniqueness. Is that the intuition? 
uh, I would say that the intuition is that you you make some averages with respect to to. So if there is, I think this is your question. If there is no noise, you have some singularities. If you uh, yes. So you you you, you have, in some sense, the, uh, when you have non non uniqueness, the solutions are applied. So you have a party solutions. So when you have the uh, the modified equations, you you get into the uh, good reach. Is that correct? Yes, yes. So I would say that you don't see that much the singularities. Maybe you have some singularities, and maybe you see them just uh, just uh, very very few, or just. Uh, you, don't, you don't see very long singularities. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so because of the noise, you you visit the space, and, and certainly you average with respect to to what you see, and so at the end of the day, you. you you don't see too much one given singularity. This is this is my answer to, to your question. I, I don't know whether you are satisfied with that. If, if you think of, of models without noise, if you have a singularity, you may see this, this singularity when you when you when you compute the in terms of the characteristics. Here, when you have the characteristics, once again, because of the noise, you modify it, and so your characteristics are going to visit the space. And at the end of the day, you are going to, to make an average. And so the contribution of one, one given singularity will be, will be quite small. So this is, uh, this is my answer. We did, we did an explicit uh, example with Rinell. Uh, that there, was, there was an equilibrium with, um, there was a mean field game with three, so three equilibria uh, without, without noise. Mm -hmm. And so when you put the noise, this was exactly the, the answer to your question in this model. When you put the noise in this model, what, what happens is that there is one equilibrium that you, you, you no longer see. So there were three equilibria. And this was in dimension one. So there was an extremal equilibria, a minimal one, and, and one in between. And so because of the noise, you, you, you jump from the minimal to the maximal. And after some time, you decide to follow one of the two equilibria. What happens is that in this situation, when the, 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 the intensity of the noise is very small, is that you select somehow the two extremal uh, equilibria. But when you compute, when you compute the, 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 the value of the game, you have some averaging property that says that the value has to be smooth. But once again, in terms of selection to the, to, for, the original, uh, for the original problem, this is exactly what you say in the sense that there are some possible equilibria, and after some time, you decide to follow one or to follow the other equilibria. This is exactly the way it, it happened in this, in this example, when the viscosity, when the viscosity, when the intensity of the noise tends to zero. So for the selection, exactly for the selection uh, to the original problem. So this is, this is my answer to your question. First, when there is the noise, you average, and when you try to select, what's going to happen, maybe, maybe, but this is a picture in dimension one, is that you are going to follow, in this example, you follow the extremal equilibrium. This was, this was the, the rule because you, you jump from one to the other, and after some time, uh, you, you no longer leave this, uh, this equilibrium. So this was a specific example that we studied with Rinder. Thank you. Uh, really, there, there are two, two questions. There are two questions in your own question. One, when the, the viscosity is given, what happens? You modify. And what happens next when you, you let the intensity of the noise tend to zero? So what do you select? Which is a much more difficult question. So maybe let's thank again, uh, François, and all the speakers of the